Buenas tardes. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue our program. So here we have our friend here, Solo, Bart Erdene. I hope you pronounce it, not, not too bad. So he's a Mongolian, he, uh, he traveled a lot. He speaks uh, Mongolian, Russian, English, Japanese, and German. And uh, he's going to talk about us, um, to us about uh, a subject that is a bit different from the others, which is quite interesting. It's about the policy shifts uh, and how this, does this affect the, uh, the minor, minor, minority language to preserve it or to help them or to make them disappear. So without waiting more, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, Richard, right? Chris, okay. Chris, I'm uh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so, without, uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Solo. Today, I will be um, presenting my presentation that I had put forth for an undergraduate research symposium uh, last year, or two years ago when I was a sophomore. And for Langfest, I've sort of modified it and definitely updated it to become a little bit more accessible and more on a broader scale, to be, uh, to be exact. So even though the title here says challenges of minority languages and language groups, I would like to start with defining what uh, minority languages and groups uh, mean for us. The, uh, I think it was the Oxford uh, Encyclopedia and Dictionary defines it as a language that is spoken less than half of the population within a given uh, local region of sorts. So it could be, you know, for example, um, in Estonia, Russian could be considered a minority language because only less than half of the people there speak <laughs> Russian, but of course we know Russian is not endangered by any means. And um, countless of examples such as that, even here English in Quebec and in Montreal might be considered a minority language. And in this case I'll be uh, specifically referring to, uh, I suppose for lack of better words, ethnic, um, indigenous, and, um, uh, and the likes of such. <laughs> so. To begin with, um, I'll quickly dive into sort of how I really got involved in this uh, stuff, even though I don't study uh, ethnolinguistics at my university. I study political science, but I grew up in, uh, primarily in the uh, metro Boston area, and I remember fourth grade, uh, we had a museum field trip, uh, we had a field trip with our teachers to Plymouth Plantation, and it was essentially a Native American um, living museum, as they called it, where they uh, showed how the first settlers and colonials, col colonialists and Puritans um, made forth uh, into their uh, drive for manifest destiny and how they clashed with, um, with the Native Americans. And they had a wonderful opportunity to um, bring us to speak with uh, and communicate a little bit with uh, still existing, um, I think they were uh, Wampanoags uh, of, of Native American tribes in, on the East. Um, do have my speaker notes here, <laughs> um, and so forth. So that was like really my first uh, uh, realization, sort of um, uh, moment of, of, of Eureka that you know people do speak a different language. Because as a kid, I was only exposed to English, and then I, was, I realized, oh wait, um, even people here uh, had a long history of having different languages. <clears throat> and then in high school, I took Japanese as one of the languages offered in my high school, and. In my first year of Japanese, uh, we started reading a little bit further into the origins of the language and so forth, and through extension of various um, uh, pieces of inform information, I began to realize that within the Japanese um, uh, peninsula and, 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 um, and region, that in the northern islands, there used to be uh, indigenous people themselves as well, called the Ainu, and I haven't done any <laughs> scholarly research on them, but what we know so far, there are virtually only two or three people left alive in this world that speak that language. And furthermore, in the southern regions, as you can see here, they speak, uh, well, quick picture of the Ainus. Um, their language is related to, uh, it was um, uh, Siberian Tungustic of, of classification. And then, um, and then in further south in Okinawa, I mean, we have Okinawan dialects, but for a long time, before they were assimilated into Yamato Japanese um, sorts, I would say, they used to be uh, 
called um, Rukukan, and the, uh, the language itself and the dialect itself is uh, Rukukan Japanese. And going further, now in college at my university, I am uh, studying German as, as, as a major. And within quickly realizing that as well, within German, uh, our professor or teacher told us and explained us that we learned the uh, standard dialect, the uh, Hochdeutsch, the high German. But here's a the uh, visual map of the breakdown of all the sorts of various different um, dialects spoken within Central Central Europe, and to me, you know, that always uh, brings and begets the question of uh, what do you classify as a language versus a dialect? And in my own personal um, experience with my mo with my mother tongue uh, Mongolian, I definitely know that it's a very great issue. It's a very great question. There is never a binary answer to uh, to the question of the difference between a dialect and a language because geographically through space and time, you know, you go east, west, north, south, you know, little things shift, change, the mannerisms, the way people interact, communicate, and all those factors combined together attribute to the um, slight evolution of different languages <clears throat> within a region. And then I remember in one of my other classes when I was uh, in college, I took a course on um, Italian, French, and Spanish uh, history in the 20th century. And our professor, he briefly mentioned how he alluded to Silvio Berlusconi as the, uh, the godfather of um, Italy in the modern days because historically there have been so many different um, dialects and flavors of Italian. Every valley, every region had its own, you know, culinary and linguistic history, but it wasn't up until the 80s when mass media and television was brought to the entire um, Italian peninsula, and Berlusconi was, <laughs> in this regard, uh, considered as the, uh, the unifier because he was the one who made the Italians understand one another for, for the first time. And as an example of, of, um, of, the, gray, of the grayness, the uh, ambiguity between in my opinion, the difference between a language and a dialect. And further, further moving on, um, in the same German class, uh, my professor introduced uh, or brought up this uh, in picture in one of her slides, and I was absolutely uh, stunned by this because I have I was not exposed to this before. And when I immediately when I saw it, I was this is uh, fantastic because it's a very elegant, clear. Um, and sensible way of understanding, you know, how the languages are related to one another, especially on the European continent. And we have a mix of Indo-European and Uralic, and you can see how English is distantly related from German as an Anglo-Saxon language, and then you have different flavors of Slavic, Indic, and so forth. And I thought, you know, I'm sure uh, people could replicate this somehow with um, other languages. And without to bore you guys, um, and another one, I guess, quick example, <laughs> was um, a museum in Paris, if you guys, if you haven't uh, been there already or not, but it's also a very wonderful um, linguistic museum. It's very thorough, um, it was, the entrance is small, but you, know, you could spend hours in there getting lost in all the material. And that was also another opportunity for me to realize you know, just how vast and rich uh, we as a species are on this planet and we're blessed and endowed with so many different diversities of, with, uh, of languages available and that are extant and unfortunately some not. <clears throat> so I guess the next point that I wanna make here moving forth is um, the, the reason why I brought those examples is uh, to develop the topic of language uh, preservation and uh, maintenance and um, uh, augmentation, I suppose. And then from the research from my original paper, I realized that there are two vectors uh, for this big question. You know, there are, let's see, quick question. Yeah, right, I'm, I meant to say this in the start of the uh, presentation. <laughs> it says, um, according to Ethnologue, there are 7,097 languages to be exact, but in constant flux. And of course, as I've mentioned, it's always a Ambiguous, um, ambiguous number, and then currently, you know, 23 languages account for half the world's population. 86% of the world speak some sort of Asian or European-based language, 
and some regions in the world are incredibly dense within their linguistic diversity, such as Papua New Guinea, um, according to the same uh, uh, source, 841 different languages um, exist in Papua New Guinea. <clears throat> Indonesia, there are 740, Nigeria, 526, and India, 455. And so, um, when I originally wrote my research paper, it was mainly focused on uh, minority language languages in the post-socialist sphere. And the reason why I say this is, um, again, you can't, it's always a gray area when it comes to these uh, things. And, um, and I was looking at for more of a, the way historically, how the policies from those areas uh, from the early 20th century, even, even earlier than that, shifted and changed over time. And especially what the current status of, of, of the legal end and um, the legal end and the, and the current situation of those languages are in, in contemporary times. And two vectors are done either through governmental efforts where the government within the region has the monopoly of violence within the territory. And then they're the ones who are able to dictate, okay, which languages are being sort of prioritized or not, or even considered or even brought up uh, for discussion and consideration. And the other vector is through uh, decentralized and non-governmental uh, uh, methods, such as yesterday's, as we've, some of you may have attended um, the Hills uh, lecture on uh, wiki, uh, wiki tongues. It's also um, through vectors like that. Um, and the reason why I brought up the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages is it was this um, European treaty, basically a, a white paper published in 1992 by the uh, European Council, and it was an initiative for them to really lay the groundwork for the infrastructure that we have today within the European Union to um, <laughs> preserve to preserve the languages and uh, bring the infrastructure so that the smaller and lesser known languages that are spoken within the other um, uh, member states of the EU are being utilized and um, treated as equal. And um, there was another uh, speech or lecture given by, uh, what was this, uh, by Christina Cunningham. This was, I think this was in uh, Bratislava. I wasn't there, but on YouTube there are, there are the, uh, uh, the, um, polyglot, they uploaded the, the videos on, on YouTube, so feel free to check them out and watch them. And moving on, um, at my university we have a department called Less Commonly Taught Language Center within, within the, uh, I think it was a linguistics department, and that was an al also a small subset of the lingu linguistics department where they offer some languages like Quechua, um, Swedish, Arabic, well, not Arabic, actually, but a few other ones as well that I forgot off the top of my head. And this one is also another example of, um, of Dr. I forget, but this was back in 2015 in the New York City one, if anyone was there. He spoke about the importance of um, learning the language of maybe someone within your own community who doesn't, of, of an immigrant community and why it's so impactful and... Um, you know, for for the purpose of saving time, I think it would be best if um, we could refer to the video itself. Because, <laughs> I mean, it would take a little bit of time to recap of what, what he said. And as I've been going through, I've tried for this presentation to um, augment and expand upon my original presentation and this is the stage where my original presentation would start. And going back into the post-social sphere, I've been basically looking at three, uh, three major language groups as a case study on how these um, uh, minority, eth minority or ethnic languages have progressed over the years since as early as back in the 19th century. The first case study would be uh, the Mongolic type of languages, which um, coincidentally, um, I speak one of those languages <laughs> since I was born and raised there. Um, so as far as Mongolic languages go, uh, they're primar primarily 
four four major distributions. Uh, one north of Mongolia. I mean, maybe I should. Yeah. So that would be the political country of Mongolia, and the little lines and pictures associate to the people who live there and the languages that they speak. So this would be a, a two a region on the map, um, politically um, named as uh, the, the Republic of Tuva. They speak uh, the language uh, Tuvan. They're con um, considered to be of uh, Tuvinian people, um, which is th one of the oldest Turkic uh, languages. But as you can see, they are heavily um, and historically closely, deeply closely intertwined with the uh, Mongolic peoples. Their lexicon is also indicative of such, um, such close relationships, as well as geographically, music, culture, food, and so forth. These would be considered the Northern Mongols in English, I would say. They live currently today within the Russian Federation, spread throughout three different republics, primarily situated around the Lake uh, Baikal, which is actually a, uh, a Mongolian word for nature. So, uh, means nature, and then the Slavs who first came to Siberia couldn't say that properly, so they resorted to saying uh, Baikal, and then in English we adopted that as Lake Baikal. Um, again, these are the type of peoples, just putting a face to the, uh, to the names and such. Uh, Southern Mongol, uh, currently they reside within uh, People's Republic of China. Again, very similar in, in, in clothing, customs, culture, and language as well. Moving further into sort of west, western China, uh, the uh, Dagurs, also, again, quite similar music as well, but more influences from other parts of Central Asia. Further, further out into Afghanistan, there are pockets of isolated uh, peoples in Afghanistan called the Hazara, which is a Persian word for, if I'm not correct, 10,000. But they are vestiges of the Mongols who were in the region during the uh, uh, empire <laughs> and the conquests. And even further out into, west, uh, in, into the western regions of Russia today, um, there's a republic called uh, Kalmykia, which is also a Mongol-speaking um, uh, part. Basically, what happened was in the 16th century, uh, Mongol tribes from the west um, took their uh, settled down in this region, right on the Caspian Sea, just north of the Caucasus. And then, I guess the distinction that I would want to make with the Mongolic languages is that the four different regions have seen completely different um, trajectories of, of their languages. And, and the fate of the languages, or the current um, status today, you know, Mongolian within Mongolia today is quite alive and well. It's spoken by the people. It's the titular, titular, titular language, and um, Mongolian within the <laughs> within Russia, it's um, it's gaining uh, more popularity uh, along the youth, and there being there is funded, or there is more resources being funded for that. Um, and the main point that I want to make, I want to say, is that again, it's one of the case studies to see how they traditionally were and how they've changed and due to government um, policies, whether those done in their constitution or more recently through, uh, through various levels of um, uh, governance on the federal and then on the, on, on the state and then they, uh, on the republic or regional, regional levels. <laughs> so going to my next one, case study would be uh, Tungustic and Paleo-Siberian. Now this one's also an interesting because uh, research indicates, or genetic research indicates that Native Americans here in North America and South America ev eventually or uh, down the line had their roots from, uh, from the Asian continent because they crossed over the uh, Bering Strait during the, I forget the exact numbers, but the languages are similar and linguistically proven that they do kind of have connections, especially uh, Tungustic and Paleo-Siberian Paleo languages. This one specifically is Ket. Um, I was fascinated with Ket because I saw a German documentary on uh, titled Happy People, and there they had a scene of a small village up in the north, northern uh, tundra 
in Russia where they had pictures of, or uh, documentation footage of people like this living about their li daily lives. And I was just um, stunned by it. And did a little further research and found out that there are currently numbers in, only in the tens and forties, less than a hundred speakers th these days. And my next um, case study example would be Karelian. So Karelian is also another fascinating story. It was, uh, there are also ethnic people uh, better known in English as Karelians. They inhabit parts of Sweden, Finland, uh, and Northern Russia. And I, yeah, and, and Finland and Sweden. I think Norway, parts of Norway as well. And what happened was during the, uh, the Swedish-Russian war, when, when the Swedes lost, they lost a lot of territory. And thus, um, these peoples were politically divided after, after the spoils of war. They speak a Finno-Ugric language, so similar to and related, linguistically related, not that it's mutually intelligible. It's a Hungarian, if I'm not correct, Estonian and Finnish. And so Karelian is also another fascinating um, case study to look into. And from what I remember, Karelian fared better during the Soviet days, early Soviet days. In fact, um, I should have mentioned that without getting into like the nitty gritty details or uh, too, too verbose, during the 19, early ni late 1920s and early 1930s, there used to be a 10-year period called Karinizatsa, um, as better known in Russian, if anyone's familiar with it. Uh, Kodin means uh, core or roots, and Izatsa is basically isation, so it was, you know, uh, rootification of sorts. <laughs> and it was a state-implemented, government-implemented initiative to uh, bring the, or to augment and, 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 and promote the regional and small ethnic languages around the newly uh, acquired territories of the Soviet Union, whether they were Georgian, Armenian, Karelian, Chuvash, Ingush, you name it, um, Kazakh, Kyrgyz. So it was a time where such languages had their own either Latin-based alphabet or some sort of alphabet. But after Stalin came into power, in the mid 30s and the war happened and after the second world war um, national policies changed and this uh, Soviet policy of uh, eth ethnocization was abandoned and rather um, turned 180 degrees and then all the minority languages were sort of for lack of better words um, forced to toe in line with the Cyrillic alphabet and uh, really being Russian as the titular language of the Soviet Union. And so Karelian used to have better days, uh, and such as others um, that I've mentioned just now during the uh, ethnocization period, the early 20s, but after that, it has definitely changed. And again, when I talk about these languages, even when I did the research myself, I was genuinely curious as to, you know, Within the textbook, I was just reading text and I was wondering, you know, what do these people look like? What, are, what kind of music do they have? What kind of dances do they dance? So I was also genuinely curious, curious and interested in that. And so the purpose of the, here in the presentation, I've rather resorted to sticking with just the visuals and mostly try to find accurate depictions of some of the peoples who come from such regions, you know, trying to link a face, a recognizable face of some sorts that makes us much more, um, uh, that makes us easier to connect with than rather than having or seeing just the word on a screen. And my fourth and last um, case study was uh, German, actually. And the reason I chose this was, you know, it was a bit of a different outlier, but yet again, followed the same um, pattern. We know that German, historically, Indo-European, European, had, has a very strong presence even to this day compared to the other ones that I mentioned. But again, um, some of the history that uh, the German language has seen in this part of the world is also fascinating because during the early 18th century when Catherine II or the Great was in power, as you know, she was German, 
um, brought in countless, countless of German uh, citizens and, um, or I guess, uh, settlers into the southern Russian Volga region uh, to populate and uh, till the soil and till the land there. And then, so originally, they emigrated and were brought over to this part of the world. Uh, they've been there and they do continue uh, to live there and to, to as far as I know, still speak a little bit of it there. But as the Second World War came down to be um, Stalin and his security forces, the cage, the NKVD at the time, yes, NKVD, at the time, um, deported pretty much every major ethnic minority aside from ethnic Russians. I mean, however you would like to define that, again, muddy territory, it's always tricky. But the reason so was, especially the, the Volga Germans have uh, fared the worst or bared the uh, brunt of this uh, assault on them because they were considered to be um, naturally dispositioned for uh, disloyalty against the uh, Soviet state. And thus they were sent in droves pretty much in one night to uh, parts of Siberia and to gulags and to uh, relocation, relocation camps in uh, Kazakhstan, parts of uh, Uzbekistan, if I'm not correct. And that's where they've been um, since the collapse of socialism. Uh, last time I read into the literature again, uh, many of them after international socialism had collapsed, a lot of them went back to uh, Germany in hopes of uh, finding a better future for themselves. And from what I remember, German during the um, socialist times prior to the Second World War and from the start of their emigration to the Volga regions, actually used to have a very, um, uh, very well-established newspaper networks, um, printing houses, publishing houses, you know, there was actually a very thriving, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, exclave, exclave of, of German speakers within Russia. So to an extent, it also depends on the critical mass of speakers and, again, how they are supported and, um, prioritized by the government that they are found within. In this case, they were within the Russian Empire. Um, and so, going back into this, the point from this part of the presentation I want to make is that um, some language groups have fared better than others uh, for various, uh, various factors, but looking into here, I think the government uh, plays a very uh, critical role in seeing how the minority languages and the ethnic languages uh, are being not only preserved but maintained and treated. And so for the past, um, when I was notified of that I would be speaking here <laughs> with you guys, I've sort of, it's been an evolution of a presentation and when I do speak about it, and originally, how are we doing on time? Are we, 20 minutes, oh, okay, 20 minutes. So when I did mention that, you know, there are 7,097 languages, 23 languages account for the vast majority of it. I think it was like 86% of the world speaking Asian or European language. So there are definitely projects around the world currently today, and so and, and so far, I've been only um, uh, able to find like really two big, two or three big projects aside from uh, Wikitongs. The first one was Endangered Languages Project. Um, again, you guys are all free to check it out. Uh, but this is a screenshot of their uh, main page. And it's basically a uh, uh, non-governmental uh, organization endeavor uh, attempting to really document and uh, portray on a, on a visual map of where these languages exist and what kind of languages they are, even if they are languages or dialects. Um, another one, very similar to it, uh, Endangered Languages Documentation Program. I think they're uh, British-Canadian. Um, I'll have to look into that again. This one was a little bit more uh, in-depth than the, uh, the previous one. Um, the, the latter one attempts to really provide more um, 
primary sources, uh, manuscripts, archives, and uh, material that people can work with, audio files, um, books, and so forth, that do come from these um, lesser known languages um, for the purpose of preservation and uh, hopefully one day revitalization. The second one, as again, some of you guys may have been yesterday, uh, for wiki tongues. This one, they do a very horizontal approach to language, um, uh, language preservation, language activism, primarily. And as Fahel Fahil said yesterday, that you know, wiki tongues as wonderful as a resource and project it is, really is only a seed starter. Um, it was designed and maintained as a way for people to, uh, as their entry point into, into um, being exposed to other languages um, and lesser known languages that really they're not trying to, within a day or within a certain given time to preserve them, but rather uh, let the people around the world join together through the power of the internet and simply take a video and upload it and be a conversation starter as a, as a foundation and platform to expand upon um, and so forth. Um, and for example, Cultures of Resistance Network, this one was also another um, internet-based uh, NGO that, as I've said, there are two vectors for language um, preservation. Uh, one is either governmental and the other one is non-governmental. And um, here, this one, as an example of the efforts being taken by people around the world. Um, these are folks like you and me, like, like you and I, um, doing whatever is possible. And I think uh, that should be the route of my presentation. Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. OK, right away. <laughs> Um, thank you for that presentation. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit, you, you touched on this when you were talking about the Karelian languages and the shift in the policies towards uh, the minority languages in the Soviet Union. Um, can you, are you able to go a little bit more in depth as to maybe why that shift happened? I'm especially curious because as maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the impression that Stalin himself wasn't actually even a a native Russian speaker, that he was like a Kazakh speaker or something. And so, <laughs> or G Georgian, was it? Oh, yeah, Georgian, so yeah, there you go. So he, right. like the idea of, you know, of this Russianization being um, demanded by someone who wasn't even a native Russian speaker. I'm just wondering if you right. know more. Going more right, well, from what I remember going into the uh, literature review and trying to decipher uh, as to how the history went out, of course, history is always written by the uh, victors, so um, what we get is whatever the perspective is, whoever wrote it. So from my understanding is that uh, during that time, it was a precarious time, the end of the Second World War, economy was um, in shambles, country was in ruins. Uh, and it, I think, uh, simplified, uh, it was an attempt to uh, increase and the, uh, the, the reach and control of the central authority, of the central government, basically, it was basically going back to centralization, where power was literally physically being brought back to, uh, to Moscow, the Kremlin, and being manif and manifested in that sense. Because if you had so many different republics, and with, even within the republics, so many countless of different um, types of peoples and their languages, again, it would be logistically difficult. And secondly, um, difficult to, to govern, so Russian did become a, the titular language of the Soviet Union, and thus we have, or the, therefore we have such a um, large number of Russian speakers around the world. Hopefully that could um, uh, go dig deeper into your question. <laughs> yeah, if that makes sense. Hi there. Uh, is it possible to back up about four slides? Uh, absolutely. Okay, it's the blue map that we saw. Right. That one. Yep. Yeah. The indigenous. So language. if you kind of squint your eyes, you can't really see any national borders except, I would argue, between India and China. Well, I mean, I think the the website um, used Google Maps 
or Google Earth as a template. Or right. Maps, I so. think. Um, anyways, I was just curious is, is if you could um, speak to why, in particular, that region of the world, um, the differences between the governments of those two countries, if any, um, would account for those differences in that specific region. Differences in the borders, or you mean the uh, distribution of the dots on on the map? Well, if the dots are evidence of uh, the dots are evidence of linguistic uh, peril, right? Right. As the key here says, green would be at risk, yeah. yellow endangered, red severely endangered, yeah. and so forth. So why so much in China and so little in India, say for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I. Num, I do not work with them. I, I was using this as a resource and as an example of the efforts being taken. So, well, my guess, and I would presume that it's because um, currently people, I think Western researchers, Westerners, can do only so much in those parts of the world. Um, you know, currently, that's what's available. So, the people who work in this project and this endeavor have really had the chance, as of now, to. Uh, document those languages and put them on their map. Yeah. Yeah. It could be it could be an artifact of a lot of things, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't. Uh, China is probably not the easiest place to get into. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the difference between the socialist or the former socialist countries and even democratic countries. Um, for example, a place like France, which you know, at first French was just in Paris and then it kind of spread like a virus. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so like how does, how, how, do, how do like the minority languages in, in democratic countries, or I don't know if you've made this comparison, fair compared to the socialist uh, countries? Uh, absolutely. So um, I, I see your parallel in the making. And uh, the reason why I actually, wrote the paper and got into this uh, project was precisely that, looking into, you know, what is the status, what is the status of these languages and how do they fare today compared to their historic past? And there's a big, big red line that I've outlined and so that's sort of the general um, outline of the post-socialist sphere, because again, China today is technically communist, but their economy is completely capitalist, but highly centralized government in Beijing and so forth. And as a case study, Mongolic, you know, you have these people speak Mongolian, they're Mongolian, but within China, it's been 20, so what, 1991, it's 10, yeah, almost like 20, 30 years since uh, international communism collapsed. But to this day, uh, the speakers, um, their numbers are dwindling, they're being um, suppressed by, and, and not promoted. Uh, technically, it's within enshrined within their uh, uh, equivalent of a constitution. But um, the reality is, uh, on the ground, it is uh, it is a precarious precarious situation. Was Mongolia, was Mongolia, yeah. Was Mongolia um, communist as well? I don't I don't know the history. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Mongolia was the second uh, communist state after the Russians. RFS, RFSFR. Yeah, RSFSR. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, which was the original Soviet Republic after the. Uh, 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 transitional government led by Kerensky. Uh, thank you. Regarding your colonization, I think uh, it was so, so started was no, it started with Vladimir Lenin, but I think that as soon as Stalin came into power, our, it was already starting to reverse the policies and suppress them. I think even before World War II, and it got even to almost extreme uh, levels after. I think it was even uh, even worse, Russification and. It's ironically coming from a Georgian. I think he even had anti-Georgian Cor policies. He Correct. That, that, Correct. That nuts. I just, uh, just interested. Uh, what do you think of the policies of the Russian Federation now towards the, uh, its minorities? Right. So when I was writing this, I um, got familiar with myself with the uh, current Russian constitution and even the various little uh, constitutions of again the republics, um, autonomous re regions, oblasts, and. Um, and, and states, as you know, Russian, Russia today is a, is a federation, technically a, f uh, a federal country and um, governmental uh, structure. And um, there are, for the most part, uh, as of today, uh, 
small language groups being um, uh, mostly left left alone to its own devices, not being you know actively uh, repressed or, or or suppressed as it were in historical Soviet times. But you know we don't see copious amounts of you know national funding or resources being allocated to them. Um, there was a case, uh, if I can remember, a year ago, where there was a piece of legisl legislation passed and that sort of wrote off Tatar as a mandatory class in, no, actually, it, well, it, was, it was either both, yeah. First they wrote it off their school cur curriculum within the Republic of Tatarstan and Kazan, and then um, the ethnic Tatars were definitely um, uh, livid with that live it with a, a response, but then afterwards they made it mandatory and then all of a sudden all the, um, what you call an ethnic Russian is, were angry because, you know, they said, oh, why do we need to learn, why do our children need to learn Tatar when, you know, Russian is being spoken, so. Um, currently today within Russia, uh, from what I know, is that um, it's, it's, it's a quiet situation, yeah. So sort of disinterest. Disinterest, sort of apathy, yeah. I think in, uh, regarding the Tatars, I think they actually wanted to switch to the Latin alphabet, and the uh, Russian state actually has uh, sent a big no to this one. Well, a I clear, clear no. I think you're referring no. to Kazakh, oh, Kazakh and Kazakhstan. No, no, yeah. no, no, not Kazakh. Kazakh, oh. is, no, no, in the, within the Russian French. Oh, okay, I within think, the RF, okay. I think, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Might have missed that. And we got another speaker after you, George. It's okay. Okay, uh, so Loth, can you? Uh, tell me, do you have any observations regarding the effect of having a, uh, a strong nationalist uh, base for a language? You have four examples here, mm -hmm. and you can point to German and Mongolian. Both there, you can point to a country where the overwhelming majority in that country speak that language, and you point to exclaves or groups, in, minority groups in other countries, right. where, as opposed to the Karelians and the Tungusic, where there is no. Uh, national homeland, a and any interesting observations comparing those situations? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, but again, that is precisely why I got into this topic for this, uh, uh, for this paper originally, was I specifically chose German as a case study uh, because I had these exclaves historical out of Germany and within the Russian Empire and now in Central Asia and Karelian as I've briefly mentioned, there are these um, reindeer herd, herding people, if I'm not correct, uh, that are traditionally have been distributed throughout northern Norway, again, parts of Finland, definitely definitely Finland, um, and Mongolian. So, uh, to answer your question, um, what was your question again? <laughs> 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 Right. Better or not, but you have a state that's promoting it, and then even outside of the, the, the country, there's all, all these people trying to uh, learn it and claim it as their own. Point whether the, the national prestige mm -hmm. is saying, you know, our people have a country, even if we don't have right. that, that has any effect on the, on the linguistic communities outside of that country. Right. Yeah, so this is wholly dependent upon the efforts taken by the uh, titular uh, peoples. or. The, the the people in the language living within their original location, for example, I don't think the uh, German government is doing too too much these days to promote uh, the well beings of uh, Volga Germans. And I mean, even now today, most Volga Germans within Russia are considered Russian and speak Russian and are Russian by any measure uh, possible, even in Central Asia. I know that for Mongolic languages, um, this one's a hairy situation, a uh, grisly situation, because uh, uh, dealing with the PRC, it's a, uh, very sensitive. Um, we have these two superpowers to the north, the Russians and the Chinese in the south. And um, for the most part, tied in with foreign policy and so forth, um, we try to maintain a balance with, with both. and not try to overstep our boundaries, whatever they may be, because we know that if we piss one of them off, then bad things will happen. 
and so uh, the sentiment is that, you know, we definitely do have native speakers in both countries uh, and, and beyond, but it's difficult to, in any foreseeable future, to um, uh, rein them in back again under one banner, for, as we might say. <laughs> precisely, precisely, yeah. <clears throat> and um, as another note, uh, dealing with any sort of issue that uh, or, or is important in our lives, everything from uh, language activism to climate change um, to whatever it may be, a lot of issues are intersectional, so it is difficult to discuss one topic without definitely bleeding into and uh, having worth spending your time to discuss the other issues because there are, in my opinion, um, different sides of the same story. Yeah, please. A very personal question, if you don't mind. Uh, it's fine. What does your name Solo mean in Mongolian? Oh yeah, well my name. Um, it's actually the first. <laughs> it's actually the first four letters of my full name. So my full name is uh, in English it's Salahu, but in Mongolian it's Salahu, and it's simply um, a name that my grandfather gave it to me. Um, he was born in a region in northern Mongolia, valleys, streams, a few little mountains, a little forested area, a little gully running through. It was called Solon Yam, and so I think he took the uh, postfix Am, um, or the ending Am, um, and replaced it with Hu, which means a grandson, since I was his grandson. So essentially I'm the grandson of the place where he was born, like a little little geographical area. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a maybe quite technical question mm -hmm. um, about the research method because do you think case study is the only way you could document all of these? Because I know this information you're finding are scarce on the internet because I've tried. Um, I actually will start my master in public policy. Oh, okay. I'm mm -hmm. quite interested in diversity management mm -hmm. and uh, language sustainability of displaced groups, language heterogeneity, sustainability, and st things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to do like my readings beforehand and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if you have any guidance about that. Right, um, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh. So i um, doing my bachelor's. I haven't had the chance to do primary research myself. So most of the uh, resources that I've utilized were uh, secondary literature, literature review, um, books, um, publications, journals, articles, anything that I'm gonna get, get my hands on and uh, turn that into, uh, or utilize that properly, and cite it properly for, for my research. So, you know, if I had the chance to <laughs> actually go into those parts of the world um, and spend time, interview them, get some sort of quantifiable data, then that would be much more meaningful. But from what I understand is that um, I've used uh, historical and contemporary resources. It, it was a mix, um, a German, a lot in Russian, um, I, 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 yeah, so yeah. And case study has to be the only way to Well, I, I say case study because I want to compare these language groups and to see how um, different, uh, the, the shift and changes of policy after the collapse of international communism had, um, had resulted for these languages, yeah. Because, you know, I saw no point in making comparison between two very similar language groups close to one another. Whereas, you know, if you compare something maybe from German, from the former Eastern European Soviet bloc, um, Warsaw Pact bloc, or something within that has both parts in the former Soviet Union and in China today, and, and, and the likes. Yeah. Would you allow me a question before I pass the microphone to the next person? So um, I have a step back question. Uh, sure. I'd like to know, okay, the, the reason why we created languages was to communicate and make this uh, transfer information the most efficient way possible. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we could imagine a, a world where everyone would speak English and uh, that would be very efficient, but yeah, culturally it would be kind of boring. On the other end of the spectrum, I guess there's a lot of languages that you have on, only a bunch of people that speak with it. And, uh, to what, when do we cut the line to say that uh, why, why uh, small languages do matter and at what point we should invest energy and, uh, and time and force people to learn the languages to, to make sure that this language survive? Where, where is the line? Personally, I think the line 
at least stems that sort of, if I could get some research done myself, um, that would that is one thing I would definitely love to investigate myself is some sort of critical mass. Every time I looked into the uh, bit of numbers and uh, read into the narratives historically and saw the results as today, um, some of it definitely depends on just the pure number of speakers uh, left alive today or historically. Um, I mean, look at look at the Hanyu um, or by Putonghua or which which is Mandarin was you know um, historically it's they've had a uh, proportionally large population numbers to the rest of the world have been and continued to do so currently two billion two and a half billion um, historically similar to that uh, proportionally or or German or Russian and so forth so I think uh, critical mass uh, matters in terms of pure number of speakers you know if it's just one village one small fishing village somewhere in a small um, uh, in a small fjord somewhere, then of course it's difficult. And not that it, they don't deserve any less means of attention, but in terms of feasibility in the future, I think if I could put a number on here right now, probably like 500,000, half a million as a baseline for having um, a somewhat feasible chance of localized survivability. Uh, in the in this day and age, with the uh, modern telecommunications, you know, being able to talk, Skype, video chat, text message, print, publish, and so forth. Thank you. So forth. So forth. Uh, so, um, well, you mentioned a little bit about the um, that a group uh, is. The, um, are the ancestors of the people in, in uh, the indigenous people in North America and, and South America. But mm -hmm. uh, what, my question is, uh, did you do any comparison between the these languages, minority languages uh, of Asia and, you know, Russia and everything with the reality in, for example, like Mesoamerica, where there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, indigenous languages that have different language families too? Um, and uh, with, with that question, do, how does the future look like for, for these languages, minority languages? Do they have like a, uh, do they identi identify themselves as, you know, as, be, as being Mongolic or Tungustic? And are they like involved politically in, in vindicating their, their language and culture? Uh, so uh, that, that would be my two questions. Right, right. So for the first one, uh, no, because I was specifically uh, looking into these four case studies within the post-socialist sphere. So, I mean, I guess I didn't really see the parallels. I definitely am familiar or aware of um, organizations in Kazakhstan. Uh, what they do is um, uh, he's, uh, he's an artist, he runs his own studio, and he does a lot of every year. Um, he proclaimed his own little holiday, not, not holiday, but a day of observance, and basically drew very strong parallels between the Kazakh people and indigenous people within uh, North America and to an extent South America. Uh, you know, everything from um, being victims of, of atomic nuclear weapons testing to um, perpetrator genocides to uh, uh, you name it. And there are a lot of parallels, I mean, essentially. Um, <laughs> historically uh, colonialism. Uh, so I guess in one in that way, there are parallels being drawn today between the uh, the new world and, and the old world in terms of um, uh, indigenous languages and, and some of the very similar um, histories and faiths they've, they've uh, maintained uh, currently. And for the second one, um, you're curious to learn more about like what they look like now, these these four cases. Well, so Tungustic and this one, Ket specifically, up up up, up in north, um, their situation is uh, is, uh, is is dire. Uh, last time I checked on the uh, uh, language uh, pr uh, preservation uh, network, I think according to them, they only had 10, 20 speakers left alive, and um, uh, Mongolic. Not, not as bad, <laughs> we're somewhere in the five million in, in total. Um, Karelian, historically, they've had about like two or three million. I think today, um, only a few towns and, and villages and regions out in the hinterlands that do speak it 
um, parts of Finland, I think so as well. I mean, German, most of the the exiled ones after the Second World War, uh, they came back to Central Asia, or from Central Asia, a lot of them packed up their bags and left for Europe, so, yeah. So, uh, one last question. So, um, mm -hmm. like for example, in, in, in France, uh, the idea of a republic, you know, it, it uh, affected the the, lo the minority languages like Occitan and mm -hmm. you know, all, the, all the other languages that are now going extinct. So, what it, what is your, opinion on that identity that all countries um, give to their citizens, but um, we know that it's not very, it's not hom homogeneous, the, the population is not homogeneous. So in Russia, for example, do you think that the, um, that that pride of being Russian has affected the, 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 um, the disappearance of the, of their languages, or is it, is there any other um, things right. that are affecting? Right. So in this in this case, to this regard, I think I could make and draw very very strong um, parallels to even here in Canada, the First Nations peoples, the Inuits, um, and and so forth from the north. Um, historically, they've the children have been plucked from their families and put into uh, reinstitution schools where they were forbidden to speak their native languages and so forth, and the history has been like that up into recent recent terms. Um, the same has occurred with uh, native peoples in Siberia. I mean, both forested places being colonized by European powers, and you know when we talk about that, now we have 300, 400 years of assimilation, um, and again, personally. Uh, for for the ease and convenience for their lives, I think it's simpler for them to initially go with the flow. You know, it's it's always difficult to go against the grain. So, I think if we were to ask these people uh, in Siberia now, you know, do you consider yourself as what? Then they'll just simply say as as um, a citizen of the RF. And even so, because of the history of that part of the world, they were Soviet, and they were imperial, part of the empire, and now they're part of the Russian Federation. And even in English, there um, is no distinction between a uh, citizen of the Russian Federation versus what, what some people might consider as an quote-unquote ethnic Russian. Um, in, in Russian, it would be uh, a Russianian is a citizen, whereas uh, ethnic Russian, like a Ukrainian or a Pole or some other Slav is um, Ruski. So yeah, even even terminology wise, it depends on how you ask that question to them. Yeah. All right. So I think we're going to stop there, and we'll stop for a, shop, a short break. So in uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.